Welcome to section 12.5 and 12.7. All right, general people, we're going to take a really deep dive into quantum mechanics. And before we get started, we got to talk about a couple of things that we should worry about. The first thing is called the observation effect. So here's the deal. If I were to take a baseball and I were to throw it across the room, you could use Newtonian physics and you can calculate the trajectory of that baseball. Now, what you wouldn't take into account is if I had the lights in the room on or off. And what I mean by that is as you throw the ball across the room, you can observe that ball. Now, to observe that ball, what has to happen is light has to strike that ball, reflect off, and go into your eyeball or some kind of detector. And the point here is that this light that's coming in and light that's coming out, the act of observation doesn't affect what's happening to that baseball. It's insignificant compared to what the baseball is doing and will not affect its trajectory. Now, the same can't be said for an electron. If I were to throw an electron across the room and I wanted to observe what's happening to that electron, as it crosses that room, well, if I were to have a photon come in, well, a photon has enough energy to change the course of where that electron's going to be. And so merely the act of trying to observe the electron, whereas the light comes in and light comes out to a detector or me, well, that is going to change what the electron is fundamentally doing. So this is a complication when I deal with subatomic particles. The mere act of observing the subatomic particles changes what the subatomic particles are doing. Now, this often gets confused with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Now, to fully understand the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, we're going to need a lot more quantum mechanics than I can cover in this lecture. So I'm just going to tell you the take home message. What this principle is looking at is the uncertainty in the position of an electron and the uncertainty in the momentum of the electron. And this has to be greater than h bar over two. So let's go ahead and try to put this into plain English. What the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says is that if I know where the electron is, i.e. I know the position of the electron, then the greater my uncertainty is in its momentum or its velocity. However, if I know the speed of the electron or the velocity of the electron, well, then I don't know where the electron is. So I can't know both the position and the velocity of an electron at the same time. One of them has to give. If I know one well, the other I don't know so well. And all of this is building up to the Schrodinger's equation. Now the important thing with the Schrodinger equation is we're going to describe an electron. Now instead of thinking of an electron as a Newtonian particle, what I'm going to do is I'm going to treat the electron as a wave. And this is the crux of the Schrodinger equation. So for Schrodinger's equation, I'm going to pretend the electron is a standing wave. What you guys can do is go ahead and imagine that you tie a string to the wall and you have the other end in your hand. What you can do is you can generate standing waves. You can go ahead and have the rope go up. You can have the rope go down. You can have the rope kind of go up and down like this, or you can have the rope go up, down, up, down, and you can have the mirror image of these. So these are standing waves, and that's what I'm going to treat the electron. I'm not going to treat it like a particle in the Bohr model where it's orbiting around a nucleus, where I know its exact location. Now, in the simplest terms, we can go ahead and express Schrodinger's equation like this. What I have here is something called the Hamiltonian. Now, the Hamiltonian is an operator. Basically, it says, do something to whatever follows. 
And what follows is the wave function. The wave function is the equation of the electron. It is an equation that represents that standing wave. On the other side of Schrodinger's equation is I will be able to pull the energy of the electron, i.e. how fast it's moving, and I will regenerate that wave function. In short, what Schrodinger's equation is going to do is you're going to do something to an equation of a wave and you're going to regenerate that wave with the energy on the outside. Now, a more complicated version of Schrodinger's equation and one you guys will see in upper division physics classes and upper division chem classes is this version. Now, we're not going to go ahead and solve this equation. The reason being is you need to know differential calculus and a whole bunch of linear algebra. And this is way beyond the scope of this class. But remember what's happening here. I have an equation. We need to solve this equation. And then these solutions, they're going to tell us where the electron is and how much energy it has. And to really emphasize that, I want you guys to understand that only certain solutions, only certain numbers will make the Schrodinger equation true. And to give you an idea of why this is true, we can go ahead and take a look at standing waves in just two dimensions. Now, what you guys will see is that I have a wave that goes around an atom. Well, that's fine because the wave will go right on top of each other and that means that the wave can go ahead and exist. And here, n equals 4 is part of the solution to Schrodinger's equation. Now, I can have another solution where I have another wave a little bit further out, and let's say that this is n equals 5. Again, my wave falls on top of itself. That means the wave is going to exist, and n equals 5 will be an appropriate solution. However, not every number is going to solve Schrodinger's equation. If I pick a number and that wave gets generated in the atom and it goes ahead and mismatches or it falls out of phase with itself, well, then I'm going to have destructive interference and the wave is going to cancel itself out. If the wave cancels itself out, that means the electron is canceling itself out meaning the electron cannot exist anymore. And so the long and short is, is that people have found the solutions to Schrodinger's equation. Now we're going to go ahead and talk about these solutions, and these are going to be represented by the quantum numbers. And we'll talk about the quantum numbers in the next lecture. However, what we're going to generate is a new model for our atom. And that new model looks like this. So again, we're going to start with Rutherford, and we're going to have our nucleus at the center. Our nucleus is going to be positively charged with our protons and have neutrons along with it. And then I have the electrons, and the electrons are no longer going to be represented by a particle. Instead, it's going to be represented by a wave. And that wave is going to tell me characteristics of how that electron is going to interact with matter and how it's going to behave. What I can say is if I have my wave function and I square my wave function, what I will get is the probability of finding the electron and where it can interact with matter and its property. So instead of having this particle, what I have is the probability of that electron manifesting its properties and its interactions. I will let you know that we are going to switch back and forth from Cartesian coordinates to polar coordinates. Put simply, instead of representing a point in space using the x coordinate, the y coordinate, and a z coordinate, what I can do is use r, phi, and theta meaning I can tell you how far to swing out, how far to swing up, and how far to, sh to shoot to a single point. All right, gentle people. Now, this lecture might be a little abstract, but I assure you it will make sense once we hit those next few lectures. 
In the meantime, stay safe.